<laughs> so, over the course of the last year or so, I've actually been paid to do mathematics, which involved um, packing pipes for the Salzkita so key here in, um, in proximity. And over the course of that, uh, I mean, the software I wrote for them isn't particularly interesting because it's special purpose only for pipes. But in the course of that, um, I learned how to do it for, for general objects. And as far as I could find, there wasn't anything on, on GitHub in the open source world which did it the way um, I want to approach this tonight and which I want to present for you. All right. So, prior art. What is that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> There's like uh, already. Uh, when you when you want, when you start searching GitHub, there are like three projects which do irregular objects, and this this one is by far the most sophisticated of them. Um, I will shortly outline the approach uh, that he did here. Basically, he um, combined a genetic uh, algorithm to decide the order of the parts, in, uh, in, in which order to place the parts, then decided uh, the left, uh, wrote a geometric algorithm to uh, put it at the leftmost free position, and um, yeah, thereby reached a pretty impressive second density. The reason why um, I thought this wasn't enough is because uh, this approach is kind of limited in when it comes to rotation. You can only do like a discrete amount of rotations because every uh, rotation is, a, is, a, is its own check. Because once you start uh, embracing the uh, possibility of having rotated objects, you invite non-linearity -linear in the form of sine and cosine and everything falls apart. Secondly, um, Basically, all of this is uh, with discrete approximations. You don't see it here because they're uh, kind of fine and it gets away with it because it places one part after another. Uh, but that's another thing that uh, kind of bugs me. I mean, it's a standard uh, informatics approach. Use everything discrete, use triangles. But like, uh, yeah, embrace continuity, I thought. So, there are actually some academics who, who already did something like that. The most basic idea is to have a function which tells you whether two objects, A and B, are overlapping. And um, the way it tells you that is by its uh, sign. So once it's positive or uh, zero, they don't overlap. Uh, once you have those functions, all you, ha all you have to do is basically minimize whatever you want to minimize, container dimension, um, whatever, subject to the constraint that all distance functions are greater than equal to zero. The way they constructed these things is by making some elaborate uh, geometric constructions for some basic objects, which are basically those. So they could handle polygons, uh, convex polygons, to be more precise. Um, yeah, and basic circular shapes, so the convex and the concave variants. I actually re-implemented as a part of my, I don't know, research uh, looking into that stuff, uh, all of the case distinctions that they made in, in Mathematica, which is like ugly as fuck, and <laughs> these, this code. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's um, not elegant at all. So there are actually people who um, extended this to ellipsis, which is like a research paper on its own. And I played around a little bit with uh, adding adding parabolas, but it's um, yeah, it kind kind of works, but it's uh, not pleasant at all. So uh, I took the main ideas, and the good parts, and try to look at the problem more in general. So this is the part where we jump between geometry and algebra. Has anyone heard an uh, algebraic geometry lecture? Great. Wow, great. Um, I had to. <laughs> <laughs> my puns. Uh, I actually flunked that twice, but... <laughs> uh, so. What you do is um, that you have your shape, 
and you define it by some, some polynomial, some uh, map from two-dimensional space to one-dimensional, and it's in the interior, once again, by some sign condition. Notice that I want to I talk, I talk about interior points here, so we have swan equal zero, because then later on distance, distances are positive. Some of the most uh, easy shapes are lines. These are contour plots, so we are looking at height lines here, basically Höhenlinien in, in German. And uh, lines are simply linear. A circle is then something like that. So that would be in the interior, circle with radius 1, dark blue is always the uh, geometric object. And you can basically do almost any nice, nice shape or form, like a parabola is, uh, has an implicit form. You can do, most importantly, all the Bezier curves up to a reasonable degree. And theoretically, you could even do hyperbolas or stuff like that. The nice part is that, of course, we are comparing with a point, essentially. Um, we can do set operations quite easily, because the point has no, no, um, oh, sorry, I forgot something to say about that. You can combine those um, basic shapes um, with unions, because for a uh, union of two of these basic shapes not to intersect, all four combinations may, uh, of, of those shapes, all combinations have to not intersect. So what we can do with the union always is, a, is build a minimum, and then for both components of these, just to be greater equal zero, both have to be greater equal zero. It's basically an end uh, conjunction. Right. What we can do for points is build intersections, and that's quite nice because that makes uh, constructing objects uh, comparatively easy. It doesn't work in general, sorry, I don't have a slide for that, because general objects have uh, a volume, so to speak. So if I take like the intersect, fuck, that was permanent marker. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, I'm going to use either prop later on. I'm going to fix my mistakes. If you want. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, uh, most easy objects are the intersection of two circles. And you want to compare them maybe to a line. Then using simply the maximum, this would be an, an overlap, because we have a uh, point here that overlaps and a point here. Because the maximum basically doesn't preserve the condition that it has to be the same point, if that makes, makes any sense. If you if you write all this down in in, fun, in the first order logic of the reals, it makes even more sense. But I mean, that's gonna get a little bit symbolic, man. So let's stick to graphics. Let's look at some comparatively easy objects. So what I did here was um, build what's in take the intersection of four lines and the basic curve of two, uh, degree 2, which is basically a parabola. You can see the contour plot of uh, that expression here on the right. And if you look at the dark blue components, we are essentially having two connected components on either side. And the expression is still comparatively simply, simple. So the problem arises how, to, how the fuck do I find out the topology of this, this stuff. And I actually, for the general case where you have um, the shape given by implicit curves, I still don't have any clue whatsoever. So I'm kind of restricting myself now to those curves where I have an ex explicit parameterization, which is still like circles and lines and busy curves and all the nice things, but we exclude the hyperbola, for example. If anyone has an answer to that problem, yeah, I'm, I'm, well, I'm looking forward to it. So, the shape I just showed can be uh, given in, ex in explicit form. I mean, I can um, parameterize to a hyperbola. The lines are kind of trivial to parameterize. And then um, I, wrote a pro uh, I wrote a code that managed to figure out the topology. 
which is basically, yeah, we have two triangles here, essentially. And these are the corresponding sides, and these are the corresponding points. This is for a two-dimensional case. Yeah, I'm not even close to being able to handle yeah, three dimensions. <laughs> I mean, I'm hopefully going to get there like sometime next year, but <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, at the moment I have to basically look at two things, which are, um, are one-dimensional curves and points. And I, I really don't want to deal with surfaces at the moment. So, let's do some topology. Basically, um, the first part is I'm going to do this statement is basically just mass speed for uh, the two objects don't intersect, don't overlap exactly when um, their boundaries don't overlap with the other object. All I need to assume for this is that our objects are compact, which isn't uh, so, I mean, it's not unreasonable con considering we want to pack them at the end somehow. Uh, I do actually have a topological proof for that, but it's not really difficult at all. What the importance of the statement is that we can focus on the boundary. Because uh, if the boundary, or if both boundaries of the both objects, of the two objects we want to compare, uh, don't intersect the other, correspond to the other object, we're fine. Everything is great. Sorry, could they um, be massive? I. Uh, Depends on what uh, intersect means. Yeah. Yes, if you only take like, um, if you would were only to take uh, one of those boundaries, but if you, I mean, yeah, if this is a trig object and um, this is a small object, so let this be A and that be B, then indeed the boundary of A intersected with B is the empty set. But of course, uh, the boundary of B intersected with A is also the boundary of B, which is considerably unequal the empty set. But yeah, that's actually a corner case you have to consider. Which is, uh, by the way, why I require compact objects. <laughs> All right. So what does it mean for a point to lie on the boundary? Essentially, uh. <laughs> essentially, outside the boundary is positive territory, inside the boundary is negative territory, considering our, our function we use to define the object. So on the boundary, by some continu continuity theorem or so, uh, our function has to be zero. All right, so we have, if we want to find those, those kind of singular points, uh, two of those objects of the corresponding function have to be zero. So what you do to generate those topologies is you take every circle <laughs> of two um, of those objects, compute all the intersections, test whether the intersections <laughs> lie outside the object or on the boundary, uh, restrict yourself to the points on the boundary, look using the using the explicit parameterization in which order they lie on the uh, corresponding curve. And then you check whether the curve actually uh, defines the boundary or is like um, these parts outside of the object. Uh, once you do all that, you get um, the exterior points and um, actually values of, of t, of your parameterization, where those points are uh, on the on the curves, and um, by extension you have your your the sides, your yeah. So once you have that, you can go back to your model, which, like stated, that uh, the objects which we don't want to intersect, or the functions <coughs> for the objects to which don't have to intersect, should be positive. So we can. Um, with the topological theorem that we can restrict that to the boundary, which is still a little problem because uh, the boundary is like one dimensional. So what we do with the uh, topological information we just used, we make this more difficult. Basically we check for all the points, all the po uh, 
points where two, uh, two lines basically meet. And we check for every, which is this expression, so economy. And we check for every site. How do, you, how do we check for a site? Well, if the minimum is uh, big enough, if the, if the minimum distance is big enough, then everything is fine. So we take our sites, we calculate the minimum distance, we check whether the minimum distance is actually uh, on the boundary or whether it's uh, somewhere far outside the object, and then we check whether uh, the minimum distance is satisfied, so if the object actually does it set. The beauty of this approach is that once you've encoded all this geometric information, you can basically minimize over almost anything you want. So I can, of course, like in the uh, first slide, use that to minimize the length of the uh, square in which I packed my, my objects. But I can also do that um, funky stuff like robot motion planning, for example. Which I would do in that case is I have my, my fixed space. I don't know, something like that. Uh, start point, I want to reach an end point. Like a heuristic solution, I want to minimize um, time. So I Give me my use the, uh, yeah, thanks. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's going to be long. Anyway. Yeah. I want to minimize energy. So it's naturally considered constraint that the this one dimensional object in this case, the path, or maybe make that a little bit wider so it's not like a singular or measure zero thing. Uh, so that that object doesn't intersect with the boundaries and has maybe the shortest path. So I minimize, um, I model this as some z curves, and then I minimize the length of the path going something like this in the end, which would May it potentially be possible using this approach. I'm going to have to figure that one out once I've done the, all the code. So, given that you actually at some point managed to set up this model, how the fuck do you solve it? Uh, well, classi to classify it first, we have a mixed integer nonlinear program, which basically means we have to make choices. Um, particularly every time we have an OR condition, condition uh, which component is relevant. Nonlinear means we're basically screwed we're, when it comes to global optimality. Uh, so, yeah, the program is basically the mathematical term of we have to optimize. Mm -hmm. There are some things that have already been in the past successfully tried for these things. One of those is a, a freely available optimizer called Bonbin, which is basic open numerical minimization also, which uses a branch and bounds scheme. So it basically tries to um, find solutions and locally optimize them and branch to all the things. I can, you, can, you could use a local optimizers like a gradient descent or whatever you have. Heuristics will play a significant role once I uh, manage to figure out all the relevant cases. And there's like some esoteric uh, stuff done from algebraic geometry where you can optimize polynomials and everything we do here is polynomial so that might potentially work. Yeah. That was I think the quick tour of irregular optic technique. Show some example techniques, maybe some at the beginning. Yeah, the thing is, <laughs> I've written like 80 lines of Pascal code, which is not <laughs> nearly enough. The example packing I uh, had in the beginning actually uses, um, doesn't use the uh, zeros of polynomials approach yet, but I've derived the explicit um, formulas for that. And, well, what I can show you is. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's screwed up, but yeah. <laughs> it, work, it, work, it kind of kind of works well for pipes. That there'll be a minimum distance between them was a requirement, so I do, yeah. 
Okay. I still have to finish the. They, they thing. need some spacing around them, or what? Yeah. No, yeah. All right. And their curvature is given, or? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, the shape of the pipes was given, but rotation and translation were free. And the black parts are like straight, and the uh, grayish yeah, parts a, are curved. Yeah. Right. That's a nice side effect. I mean, it's a fuck up of my plotting, um, but <laughs> it's it's totally it. intentional. It's, 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 <laughs> it's a nice highlight to of see the uh, composition. Yeah. Indeed. How you construct the curves. But oh. see, that's the reason I never fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's gonna. I'm gonna put it up on my GitHub once it's uh, usable. Or something <laughs> approaching. <laughs> <but> <laughs> TM. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Are those a set of optimal solutions? Or? Mm -hmm. Oh no, um, the project I had there actually went farther. Um, this one is basically for one plate on one optimization run. And there I had to couple it with an allocator, something that puts on multiple plates and can handle like large orders. Yeah, those are examples. All right, thanks. Start some optimized DAVA project that other people work for you. <laughs> put this in a game. <laughs> yeah, put this in a game. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, humans, humans are unreasonably effective at this. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I throw like a, a CPU which does like 10 to the 9 operations per second at that and it runs for an hour or two and it, I basically get the same performance as someone who sits there with a pencil and draws stuff. <laughs> I mean, it, look at look at that project. Yeah. I mean, I studied recognizing mathematics. a hand in a picture is shit. like okay, there it is, <laughs> and now check it. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I can do that. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> you can do that. You should just that's just pen. <laughs> <laughs>